We have always used technology to create art. Every new invention usually ends up being used in the art process. Miller Horns of Akron, Ohio uses a color copy machine to create and enlarge his art. First, I'm approached by the architect or um, a art consultant about the space in which they want the image to be put in. Later on, I'm taken to the site, and then they allow me to come up with the concept for the, the space. Uh, right here, I have two benches that I photographed, um, and they're from around the area of Akron. And I believe I'm going to use this one here um, for my uh, image. And now I'm going to place this one on the copier, enlarging the image to 200% so I can work with it. Now what I'm doing is cutting out the bench so I can um, take this and put it on a, another sheet of paper. And then I'll begin to enlarge the image so I can do a line drawing. And I'm using an X-Acto knife. You can use that um, also um, for um, tight spaces. And you can use scissors or whatever you want to use. And now I'll be taking this image and put it on another sheet of paper and going to the copier and making another enlargement so I can see the detail more clearly. What I'm doing now is using this uh, stick glue just to tack it on so I can uh, make a copy of it. Now I'll be large in the image uh, up to about 200% more so I can start on the line drawing for the work. Bigger is better. After making a copy um, of the bench and enlarging it, I made a line drawing and I made a transparency because I was wondering about the direction I should have the bench facing. Now what I'll be doing is deciding on what kind of background to put the bench in. Now I'm deciding on which background I want to use for my uh, bench. The images that you see here are images that I um, had taken with a photograph. Uh, well, I photographed the clouds and uh, the maple leaves and so forth, uh, put on a copier and did the same process pretty much that I did with the bench in terms of tracing and outline and, and stuff. I think I'll go with this background here. Now after placing the image down, the next step will be copying the transparency in my uh, image underneath to make one. Now I'm going to begin to start working with color. Um, sometimes I get my color through use of color paper, or sometimes I use different things like a color marker. But this particular image, I'm going to be using color paper. These are a few of um, the colors I've already cut out. And I'm going to show you how I go about my process of deciding on the color. Sometimes in deciding on what colors can take a good uh, amount of time because I have to play with like um, what mood I want this image to um, project. Once I place the colors on and I make a decision on the colors, then I glue the these pieces onto this paper, and then I make a color copy from this. I've decided on the colors and the composition, and now what I'm going to be doing is to enlarge this piece to six by eight feet, which will bring the bench up to almost life size. I'll be doing this 
with the engineering machine and repeating the same process that you've seen me do on the smaller versions. I was asked to be the first night artist in the um, year 2000, and I was hit with a complicated uh, theme. But I was able to sort of resolve that in regards to a local event by using a Akron City map um, that shows all the streets of Akron downtown. The center image, I had to go and do research. I went to fire department and found a safety net that I used for the central image. And the numbers that are falling down um, upon an, the net was images that I uh, created myself to create this collage. One of the things that the medium offered me is an unlimited possibility of size and subject matter that I did not have with other mediums. In closing, I would like to say that bigger can be better. So go out there and make it big. Logan Fry of Richfield, Ohio, combines old technology, a loom, with new technology, a computer, to create his art. He even goes one step further and marries the old technology of weaving with binary code used by computer to get his message across. The visual sources that I use for my weaving are circuitry, technical design, microchip design, medical imaging design. My current project is a, a piece of conceptual art. Uh, it's basically a painting with words, but the words that I'm going to use aren't spelled with an alphabet. It will be spelled in machine language. The weaving that I want to do is based on a, a saying, all art can be reduced to a sequence of binary bits, zeros and ones in endless succession. What I did was to translate those into characters so that I could uh, represent an alphabet uh, in a, a block form for weaving. I translate my phrase into hexadecimal language. I've got to decide how much yarn I'm going to need, how wide it's going to be. I've got to order my yarn and set up so that I can put the yarn on the loom for weaving. I know how many yards of color are on each cone. Uh, I do my calculations and I come up with a total number of yards that I need to weave the particular project that I have in mind. In preparing the yarn to put on a warp on the loom, I go from large cones of yarn and I wrap them onto individual smaller cones because I'm going to have 60 cones like this. Now, to wind up a cone, uh, these are actually spare cones uh, from large cones that once they're empty, I've cut the top off. These actually have notches on the bottom, but I never bother with the notches. I just catch it by bringing it through the cone and catching it on the top. I slip it through this thing, this little, uh, this little piece here. I wrap it around my counter because I need to know exactly how much yardage I have on each cone. I've got all of these extra cones. I slip that on top. That serves as a retainer. Oh, that's 115 yards. I'm going to back it off just a bit. I make 60 cones like this. I put it on my cone rack. And then from there, it goes directly on the loom as warp. This particular loom, which is an AVL loom made out in Chico, California, uh, has a warp winding system. This is the warp beam on the back. And we need a way of getting the yarn, which we put on the cones, onto the warp. You need the yarn to go straight on and straight around. And this is what this warp system does. I bring the threads off of each of these cones through this first reed, through these little cloth heddles, and then I bring it through the second reed. Once I have the yarn through, I bring up the tension bars. This puts the tension so that the yarn doesn't pull off real easy. comes through here at a e nice, even tension. And what I do is I bring uh, this string around my cloth beam and tie it onto the string. I get it lined up. You'll see pegs on the beam. This is called a sectional beam. Each section is two inches. I turn the handle 
counterclockwise, wrap it on. I bring down the individual sections, two inch sections, and I locate the cross that I put in uh, a yard before the very end of the warp. Locate the, that cross, I open it up, and then I use lee sticks, which are suspended by little strings. I put the cross on the lee sticks. I can get it on that side. And on this side, I don't really need to worry about it as long as it crosses properly on that side. Bring it back onto my string so it's suspended. Then I'll usually put a, another knot. The purpose of this knot is for those times when the dog walks underneath the loom or the cat decides to play on top of the loom that the whole thing doesn't fall off. And now I'm ready to start putting the yarn through the heddles and through the reed. This is the most laborious part of the weaving process. So I've got to put my sleigh hook through the reed, through the heddles, capture the yarn, and then pull it back through. It's probably, it's a good 12 hours of work just getting the yarn, yarn through the heddles. The trick to weaving is being able to lift your threads in different sequences. Because what you're really doing is you're interlacing the warp with the weft that goes back and forth through the warp. Now the trick to double weave is you're actually weaving two layers of cloth at the same time. You're weaving a blue cloth in this case and you're weaving a white cloth. And the trick to getting the design into the double weave is that you change which cloth you weave on top. You may have blue on top, then white on top, then blue on top, and white on top. You can do stripes that are horizontal, stripes that are vertical, stripes that are squares. And once you can do a horizontal, a vertical, and a square, you can design almost anything uh, using the double weave on the loom. My current project reads, Time exponentially speeds up. And it's attributed to Ray Kurzweil, who wrote the book, The Age of Spiritual Machines. It may seem strange to see something as old-fashioned as weaving in the context of high-tech art. Uh, the loom itself, the Jacquard loom, formed the basis for the first computers. One of the very interesting things about our culture and language is the way we use concepts from weaving and from fiber in discussing the internet, for example. We speak of the World Wide Web, the internet, uh, the network. Uh, as you go into a news group, you follow a thread. Fiber and the concepts of fiber and the way we think about fiber also affects the way we think about everything in our lives. Teaching materials for sharing art are available on the web at wneo.org slash sharing art. Funding for this series was provided by the Martha Holden Jennings Foundation and Northeastern Ohio Education Association. NEOEA's members include elementary and secondary teachers, university professors, and support professionals proudly serving students attending the public schools and colleges of Northeastern Ohio.